Hey everybody, this is a old automotive car battery charger and it's not working right so I'm going to fix it and if you have an old charger like this that isn't working right and you'd like to fix yours, well I invite you to follow along with me for the next few minutes while I show you how to do it. There's a real common problem that happens with these units that is pretty simple to resolve and um, we're going to take a look at this guy, find out what's going on, and get it straightened out. Now, maybe one of the questions is, is it even worth fixing? And if this is a smaller unit, say 10 amps or less, I probably wouldn't be so excited about fixing it. More modern car battery chargers have a lot of features to them that this lacks, such as switching power supplies, which are more lightweight, more efficient, cheaper for the manufacturer to put together and more complicated to service. Uh, probably more importantly, modern car battery chargers have features such as the ability to monitor the battery charge state. And so once the battery becomes fully charged, the charger backs off down to trickle charge mode or it stops trying to charge the car battery. Oh, an old charger like this will just continue to push energy into the battery forever and if you leave it on there long enough it will probably just boil all the water out of the battery and damage the battery. The new chargers also are set up so that if you accidentally short out the clamps you don't do any accidental arc welding. Not so with this. But this is a good unit for me because it is a big unit. It's rated for 200 amps. I think that might be a little optimistic, but nevertheless, it's a powerful battery charger. And this is a good tool for me for starting up cold cars. I can put this charger onto a car battery and give it a pretty stout charge for 15 or 20 minutes which will help push some fresh energy into the battery and it also helps warm up the car battery and when the car battery is warm the battery chemistry works better and you get more cranking amps out of it and so I can put this on the battery for maybe 20 minutes give it a good charge and then you can put it to boost mode while you try to crank the car engine over and with the car battery plus this in boost mode together you've got enough power to maybe make things happen. But in the case of this unit, a while ago it just seemed like it wasn't doing a very good job of charging batteries. I could still hear the transformer humming in it, so it sounded like it was working, but it didn't seem to be getting batteries charged up. So I decided to take a look at it, figure out what's going on, and I started that adventure by just grabbing the multimeter and measuring the voltage that comes out of this device. And the voltage on 12 volt charge setting was about nine and a half volts. Well, you're not gonna charge a 12 volt battery with only nine and a half volts. So that's a clue. Then I put the meter into AC mode to check the amount of AC ripple. Uh, this is supposed to be putting out DC, so we'll see how much AC is coming out. And the AC ripple was pretty high at about 5 volts. And so that's a pretty good clue that one of the diode rectifiers in this device has failed. And that's a pretty simple fix. Now, I expect a power supply like this to put out something above 12 volts in order to charge a 12 volt battery. And it's not a regulated filtered supply, so there's going to be some ripple on it. But I don't expect 5 volts of ripple. So I'm going to do a little segue here and talk about the principles of operation, show you how this thing is supposed to work. And then we're going to take a look inside of it and see what we can do about getting it fixed. These car battery chargers are simple rectifier circuits. And here's a schematic diagram of the simplest rectifier circuit. On the left side at the top, the AC comes in from the power mains at 120 volts AC. And it goes through a transformer. 
and that transformer steps down the voltage to a voltage level that's appropriate for charging our batteries. And the output of the transformer is also an AC signal swinging between positive and negative. But on the battery, we only want to apply positive energy to the battery's positive terminal. We don't want to supply AC for, for the battery. So we have a diode that the power goes through. And the diode acts like a one-way valve. So it allows current to flow in one direction, but not the other. And it's not a perfect valve, but... For the sake of this discussion, let's assume that it is. The resistor, R, is the load, which would be the battery that we're charging. Now, in this circuit with a single rectifier diode, it's only letting through the positive side of those pulses. And you can see the output waveform that would occur on the lower right part of the diagram. Now, of course, the problem with this is that we're only getting a stream of pulses out, and it's only half the time. The other half the time, nothing is coming out. So we're not getting a very efficient setup out of this half-wave rectifier. So we then modify the circuit to add a second diode and make a full-wave rectifier, which is actually how this battery charger is wired. And that's depicted here, where we have the transformer with the input. And in reality, we actually have multiple taps on this AC input side, so that we can have different scaling of the transformer between low charge rates and high charge rates. Then on the other side of the transformer, the output side, you see that there are now two rectifier diodes and a center tap. And each diode works with one half of that waveform. So on the positive side of the waveform, we use that diode on the top to pass the output through. And then when the wave goes negative, the diode on the bottom side of the diagram, D2, passes current. And because it's a center tap transformer, the way that this all ends up working is that you get an output waveform that has if you will, effectively flipped that bottom side wave up to the top. And so now we get a pulse train out of the system where the first pulse is serviced by the first diode and the second pulse by the second one, and it alternates back and forth like that. So if one of our diodes has failed, we're going to get a pulse train that only has half of the pulses like the previous half-wave rectifier that we were just looking at, and we'd only get half the output that we're expecting. All right, so I've pulled a few screws and flipped this case open, and we can take a quick look at what's inside here. You'll see that the star of this show is one humongous power transformer right here which is what takes in the 120 volt AC and puts out a lower voltage AC that's scaled to be in battery charging range, probably 15 volts or thereabouts, I would presume. There's a few other minor things in here. We have the uh, control switch, which switches on the primary of this transformer, which does some voltage scaling. We got the amp meter, which shows how much current's coming out. Over here we have what appears to be a circuit breaker and attached to the circuit breaker is a little buzzer so apparently if we overload and hop that breaker then the current goes through this buzzer which makes it buzz and lets us know something bad happened. And then on each side right here and over here we have a rectifier and one of those guys has undoubtedly failed. Uh, this rectifier also has a little thermal switch on it, so if it gets too hot, it shuts the unit down. And so these are old, I believe, selenium rectifiers. And as you can see, they're physically pretty good size. They handle a lot of current, and so we need to swap them out with a new rectifier. And I'm not going to use old selenium parts. It's the modern age, so I'm going to use a silicon rectifier, which uh, is a lot more efficient. And those are some pretty big diodes. And so I was doing some hunting around looking for appropriate diodes, and the best deal I could find was a bridge rectifier module, 
which is this guy right here. And so this module right here actually has four big diodes internally inside of it. I only need to use two. So I'm just going to be hooking up the transformer AC input to the AC side of this. And I'm only going to be using one of the outputs because I only need to use half of this unit. I don't need to use the other side. And so I can just leave the other terminal disconnected and that'll be fine. Uh, this unit, this uh, silicon bridge diode assembly is rated for 200 amps at 1600 volts so um, yeah that ought to do it I would think uh, I could have just bought a couple of big diodes but I could buy this whole assembly for less and so what I'm gonna do is take these guys out of here or at least just disconnect them and take the leads that are running to each of these rectifiers and attach it to this device and the output leads will come off of the output of this. And so we're going to get rid of these two and replace it with this guy. And I'm going to try to find a good place in the chassis to mount this dude. Maybe, maybe I can fit him right back here. That would be nice. Then I wouldn't be tying up anything on the side of the chassis. But um, So that's my next step. is I'm going to cut the wires off of these old rectifiers and put some terminal lugs on them, connect them up to this device, and we should be ready to rock and roll. This thermal sensor that is attached to this one rectifier I think can go as well since we're not going to be using these guys anymore. And um, it's possible to thermally overload this one, but I don't see a way I can easily get a temperature sensor on it. And I think at 200 amps, I'm not going to be running this unit hardcore at 200 amps for very long, just a few second bursts here and there. So my suspicion is we're going to be just fine. So I'm going to get to cutting some wires and uh, we'll continue the process. So all I'm going to do is take these two lines off the transformer and put them on the AC terminals of our new rectifier block. And this line and this other line up here will be attached to the negative output from the bridge rectifier block. So let's get to cutting some wires and uh, doing our splicing. So like I mentioned, the first thing I'm going to do is cut the wires going to this thermal sensor. So I'm going to cut him and we're going to cut him. <coughs> we'll strip these dudes, solder them together. That's some, real <clears throat> that's some rubbery insulation. So I'm going to take these wires like so. Just going to twist them together. Okay, so we've connected the wires that used to go to that thermal sensor, and I'll just put a little solder on them. There we go. sure that's warm enough so the solder gets in there nice, like so. Trim some of this excess length off of it. Yep. 
And I'll put a wire nut on there. Just to uh, mostly act as insulation so we don't have a hot wire rolling around in the chassis. Now let's cut the wires that uh, go to these old rectifiers. Wire coming off the transformer. This is the output wire. Those are tough. And likewise on this side, wire from the transformer and the output wire, which goes to our negative output, <clears throat> like so. And now, that can come out. So I'm going to take these wires to come off the transformer, right here and right here, and we will put some uh, terminals on them. Hopefully, ooh, he may not reach where I need him to go. That one will definitely reach. Let me make sure if I have enough links there. <clears throat> this is going to drop in place like so. Oh, I think that'll make it, and that'll make it, and these wires, this one, and this one here, will be attached to the negative output terminal, so they'll be fine. So let's strip each of these wires. And we'll put some connectors on them. Okay, like so. <clears throat> and we got that one. All right. And I'm gonna clamp some down. I'm going to just bite these connectors down a little bit to mechanically hold them in place. Yep. Sure, everybody's nice and solid. Let me do that. Okay. And next, we will get the soldering iron, and I'll apply a little bit of solder to these guys so that they uh, have a real good connection. Give me some solder. Thank you. 
And I get enough heat in there so I know that I've got a nice solder connection. Yeah, like that. That's starting to look good. I want to see a nice solder flow with all the parts. Like so. And for these guys, I think I'll grab him with my tool so I can hold him laboriously. It helps if you put a little bit of solder on the iron and then put that against your part. It helps conduct the heat into whatever you're working with. Ah, running away. Heat him back up again. Okay, you're gonna do that. That's fine. I think that's pretty good. These are some thick wires, so they kind of hold their heat for a little bit. This is not a semiconductor or anything, so I'm not too worried about applying some heat. Alright, so we got those guys soldered on, so now all we have to do is attach them to our rectifier module, our bridge rectifier, and bolt it up here on the side. We should be good to go. Okay, so that's this guy, and that's this guy right here. Okay, they're all cool. Right, right. These are the two wires that go to the output block right there, that output fuse. I'm just going to run them like that, and they shall be connected to here. If I can get everybody to get on there real nice. and behave. I'm going to try to get those guys kind of centered. And tighten him down snug. Not crazy, but snug. Like so. Okay, and so the idea is that this terminal block will mount right in there like that. Okay. And then these leads coming off of our transformer go on these connections right here. Nicely centered. 
centered. So. Okay, so this one will come around and go under as well. I'm going to put you on like that. Make sure I got clearance to the side of the chassis. Make sure that everybody's tight. I mean, I don't want to break anything, but I also no work handling some current here, so I want a nice snug connection. Okay. And we'll just do a quick trial fit to make sure everybody's going to just drop in there like he's supposed to. That looks pretty promising to me. And uh, there's the holes. So he's going to sit in there just like that. Beautiful. Now before I attach this to the chassis, I'm going to put some thermal compound on it on the back side here so it can help conduct heat from the part to the chassis. I'm just going to grab a little dash of this stuff. It really doesn't take a whole lot. And uh, This is some stuff that it's best if you don't get it on you. It's kind of messy. Okay, I'll just spread that around the surface so this thing can get a good thermal connection to the back panel here and dissipate any heat that it creates. Now these are silicon rectifiers as opposed to the old selenium ones. The silicon rectifiers are more efficient so they'll probably create less heat per amp than the old ones. So if I can just set this on top of those guys and then that in place, I can tighten up the hardware. Into the approximate position. Okay, let's try not to break anybody, but get him seated down against the back panel so we have a little heat sink operation happen. Torque them out so they're snug, but not crazy tight. Okay, I don't think that's going anywhere. So, 
AC from the transformer goes to the top terminals. Negative goes out to this guy right here. And I think that's a wrap. This is tied through so he won't have an issue. And I think with that, we should have this unit fixed and we will fire it up and see what happens. So that completes our repair. Put the case back on, hooked it up to a battery, and in the lowest setting, it's now putting out 12.7 volts, which I think is perfect because a automotive battery that is fully charged is right about 12.7 volts. So in the lowest setting, this will act like just a very gentle trickle charger that might eventually get the battery charged up. As we go to the higher settings, it's now reading higher voltages and topping out at about 16.8, which is pretty aggressive, but that's what this is. So I call that a success. If you're interested in more videos about hmm, success, please come back and I encourage you to subscribe. Thanks for coming along while we repair this unit and I hope that it was interesting and educational for you. I hope to catch you again soon on another upcoming video.